Okay, before we look at some of the aspects of textual criticism and then translation philosophy techniques, I want to uh, just begin with uh, a couple of our presuppositions as we uh, come to the text. Now, I, I would say that a lot, really, of what I'm dealing with here uh, in this little special seminar are things that I've addressed in other classes that you're taking uh, in OTI, NTI. So I, I don't want to rehash everything, but uh, again, per uh, Presbytery instructions, we're trying to get this into a uh, solidified uh, context here. So there may be some repetition here, but bear with me, and I think we can put this in proper perspective. Uh, but if you've had introduction, and I deal with this briefly in both OTI and NTI, I start with uh, the idea that there are two questions that we have to uh, be concerned with. Number one, how do we know uh, that the Bible is the Word of God? And the second question, how do we know we have the Bible? All right, how do we know the Bible is the Word of God? And how do we know that we have the Bible? And answering that question, those questions, uh, require certain presuppositions. And we understand that everyone comes to the Bible everyone comes to the Bible uh, with certain presuppositions. Uh, we don't come to the Bible with an open mind. There are going to be those that say they do, uh, but they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, and it's deceptive in many, many ways. We either come to the Bible with the presupposition that the Bible is God's Word and we are subservient to it, or we come to the Bible with the presupposition that we will make the determination uh, as to what's right, what's wrong, what is God's Word, what's not God's Word, so forth. Uh, now, my concern in this uh, little discussion will be particularly with the second question: How do we know that we have? Uh, how do we know that we have the Bible? The first question: How do I know the Bible is the Word of God? It boils down to faith, right? It boils down to faith, very simply, uh, that God has revealed His Word. We have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we have faith, therefore, in what Christ says. We have faith, therefore, in what Christ says about the Bible. What do I know about Christ and what I see in the Bible? What does Christ say about the Bible? Many of our verses of inspiration and our understanding uh, of what it is to be an inspired book, uh, a revealed book, comes from the words of the Lord Jesus himself. So the bottom line there, uh, we understand God's word to be God's word because of faith. We believe it. All right, We believe it. Uh, that is not make-believe. Uh, that is not something that is subjective. Faith is objective, and the value of faith is always determined by the object of that faith. Uh, so it's real, but it is based upon the presupposition of faith. Now, I, I want to deal specifically, I say, with the second of those two questions. Uh, how do we know uh, that we have the Bible? And we start with the presupposition here. We start with the presupposition that the Bible is indeed inspired. The Bible is inspired. And I'm going to emphasize this because much of our, uh, much of the folly, all right, much of the, and I don't know any other word to use here, please, uh, much of the stupidity, all right, frankly, much of the stupidity uh, that surrounds even the argument for preserving the use of the authorized version and maintaining uh, the use of the King James Version is based upon some, uh, at best, I say, stupid statements, uh, and at worst, things that really are unorthodox. Now, when we speak of inspiration, again, this is not a theology class where we're going to deal with all of the uh, proofs of this, but I do want to make sure we understand it. Inspiration is a supernatural. Inspiration is a supernatural act of God, work of God. As the Holy Spirit of God breathed out, took these old men, these prophets, these wise men, the apostles, whoever, these authors of the Scripture, and breathed out, God breathed out His words. Holy men of old were moved, born along by the Spirit of God. Uh, inspiration, a supernatural, miraculous work of God. Now, we start there. We start there. 
Now, when we look at inspiration, there are two aspects then in which we understand inspiration. First of all, as a process, we can talk about the process of inspiration, and we can talk about the result of inspiration, or the product. Uh, the process of inspiration, or if we want to preach this someday and you have to alliterate it, we'll call it product, all right? The product uh, of inspiration. The process of inspiration, the process of inspiration is a work of the Holy Spirit, what we described just a moment ago, that work of the Holy Spirit that uh, controlled supernaturally these human authors using their abilities, their talents, their background, their skills, whatever, but breathing out the Word of God through those men, a supernatural intervention, supernatural process, the work of the Spirit of God. Now that is past. All right, that is past. That is no longer happening. I hold, I'm a cessationist, all right? I'm a cessationist. And I do not believe in continuing revelation. And if I do not believe in continuing revelation, I do not believe in continuing inspiration. Uh, I believe that revelation ceased at the close of the New Testament canon. All right, and follow this, please. A cessationist is going to argue that revelation ceased at the close of the New Testament canon. This is where we end up with some very serious problems in if I say that the King James translators were inspired. Because inspiration is inseparably tied up to revelation. And if that is inspiration in the same sense, then we have continuing revelation. You cannot be, all right, if we're going to be logical here and consistent, you cannot be King James only arguing that you have the uh, inspiration of that process of translation and be a cessationist, right? Bottom line, bottom line, I'm a cessationist. So the translation process is not inspiration in the same sense that Paul was inspired, that Moses was inspired, that Isaiah was inspired. That is a historic process. It's a historic process. So uh, when I hold up a translation, is it inspired? Well, what do you mean by that? Process-wise? No. The process is historic. The process of inspiration. Holy men of old moved by the Spirit of God. Supernatural work. That uh, is past. But the consequence of that, the consequence of this process is a product then that is inspired. All right? It's a product that is inspired. The consequence, the result of this process, the intended consequence of this is a product then that is inspired. So I can hold up an English Bible and say this indeed is the Word of God. Uh, God did not inspire Moses all right, to write in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. That is not what God inspired Moses to say. Bereshith bara Elohim. Yeah, okay. Moses was inspired with Hebrew words, not English words. But those English words, in the beginning, God created, is that the inspired word? Well, sure, because it is the consequence of that process, you see. But we must make that distinction. We must make that distinction. If I confuse those two, if I confuse those two, uh, we're going to end up with some very foolish and potentially unorthodox, uh, unorthodox statements. So as a Translation is faithfully and accurately reflecting the Word of God? Yeah, it's inspired. So it is not just that it was, I can't, it's not just that the Bible was inspired, it is inspired. All right? It was, in, it was past tense, inspired as a process. It is inspired as a product. You with me here? That to me is an essential uh, distinction that must be made, but that's my presupposition. All right, that's my presupposition as I come to the Scriptures. I believe it is the inspired, and therefore all of the implications of that infallible, inerrant, whatever, uh, word of God. Now, second aspect of that. Second aspect of that. When we look at this inspired, when we look at this inspired word, I lost that thing again. There it is. When I look at that inspired word, process, past, 
product as it reflects accurately and faithfully this, present. But inspiration then demands, and here's my next point of logic here, inspiration is going to demand preservation. All right, preservation. Now, whereas inspiration Whereas inspiration is a supernatural act of God, preservation is the operation of providence. It's the operation of providence. But providence is a work of God. All right, Providence is a work of God. The miraculous, insp inspiration, can I put it in this term? Inspiration was an extraordinary. It was an extraordinary and out of the ordinary work of God. God is not inspiring constantly, all right? That was historic, that was bad. Here's Moses, and then Joshua, and then all of the other uh, prophets. Process. Supernatural. Preservation is the ordinary work of God. It's the ordinary work of God, but just because I say it's the ordinary work of God does not diminish the fact that it's the work of God. God is. Preserve. This is his providence, whereby he preserves and he governs all that he has created to the end of his own glory. Preservation. Now my presupposition is, my presupposition and what we're going to be uh, arguing here ultimately as it relates to the issues of the text, is that inspiration demands preservation. Inspiration demands preservation. It demands preservation on two levels. First of all, it demands preservation of the books that God inspired. Pentateuch, Joshua, Isaiah, Romans, what have you. Inspiration demands preservation. That's why, you know, if we, you know, we've been finding... We've been, if you, if you look at the news and whatever and keep up with some of this stuff, you know, there, there's a new little, there's a new little Greek fragment that has come to light, uh, most likely from the Gospel of Thomas or something that talks about Jesus having a wife, you see. And it's dated very old. And some are saying, ah, is that God's word? No, not been preserved, all right? Not been preserved, not to speak of the fact that it's unorthodox and whatever else. But just because something has been picked up out of the dust, right, that has been hidden for centuries, that's not preservation, all right? Preservation is a continuing thing here. So the books, so this relates to our discussion of canon, all right? And that's not part of our agenda here, but it's one of the implications here of this, uh, this piece of logic. The books that were inspired, our understanding of canon, our understanding of canon. Books were canonical. If you've had my introduction classes, how many times did I say this? Yeah, that books are canonical immediately upon their writing if they're inspired. Inspiration demands canonicity, and canonicity demands preservation. All right, so that refers to the books. But it also refers to the text, to the words. All right, to the text of the words. If God breathed out every word, right, we talk about a verbal inspiration, yeah? We talk about a plenary inspiration, full inspiration, not only words but sense but meaning, right? We talk about a, uh, a, a verbal inspiration. They're the focus particularly upon the words, all right? Every single word, every single word breathed out by God. If it's inspired. It's preserved, all right? Inspiration demands preservation. Now, that raises the question. That raises the question, if God's word has been preserved, if every word has been preserved, how do I know those words? Where can I find those words, all right? How do I know those words when I see them, all right? Can I have the assurance? Not so much a problem, right, with the books, all right? You just look at your index of your Bible, and there they are, all right? Uh, process by which that was developed. But how do I know about those words? 
How do I know about those words? All right, now, I'm arguing, here's my presupposition, that inspiration yeah, demands preservation. It demands preservation in regard to books. It demands preservation in regard to words. And this now, this now is where we start to discuss Yeah. Why well, can't I keep track of that thing? Textual criticism. All right, textual criticism. Now, textual criticism is sometimes referred to as lower criticism. Lower crit, you'll see these terms interchangeably. Lower criticism, textual criticism. Lower criticism in contrast to higher criticism. Higher criticism deals with what? Issues of what? Origin? The, 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 the theme, you know, there, there, there are benign aspects. Now, we tend to use the word higher criticism for a critical and liberal thing, but if we can set that aside, higher criticism technically deals with issues of theme, of date, of authorship, integrity, all right, of, of the book. And it's because of those issues that then you start getting the critical notions of uh, the literary criticism and, and whatever else. But deals with the bigger issues of, of, of the book's message. Lower criticism, the fundamental level, all right? Not lower in the sense that it's base and perverse, as some would say, because they're reflecting their ignorance. Lower criticism, it just deals with the foundation of the text, all right? The very word level. So textual criticism, lower criticism are interchangeable terms. The study of the literary work to establish the original text. And in biblical studies, it refers specifically to the analyzing and the collating and the comparing of all of the witnesses of the text of Scripture to define what that original text uh, was. And I've got some terms here. Let me... One, two, three... have to have another copy. I, I thought there was only going to be five in here, but uh, look on with somebody for now, and then you can make a copy of that after class. Uh, these are some terms involving, and what I just said in uh, regard to what textual criticism is, you can see in that first paragraph. Textual criticism, or lower criticism, is the study of a literary work to establish the original text. In biblical studies, it refers specifically to the discipline of analyzing and collating and comparing all the witnesses to the text of Scripture with a view to identifying the precise wording of the original biblical writings. It is a welcome discipline, and I emphasize this. Textual criticism is not our enemy. Textual criticism is a welcome discipline to those who affirm the verbal inspiration of the Scripture. So welcome discipline, but it is a discipline. It is a discipline, a separate aspect of biblical studies. But I say it's a welcome. If I believe, all right, as I do believe, and as the free church believes, as you believe, I trust, as we believe in that, in, in that word that God inspired, that breathed out, right, I want to know what those words are, right? If I believe that God, in truth, by His Spirit, breathed out every single word of the Old Testament, of the New Testament, then I have a vested interest in knowing what those words are. And textual criticism becomes the means whereby we identify those words. Now, before we go any further, I want to define some terms here. And what I have on the sheet that I've just given to you uh, are some uh, key terms that we'll define very quickly. 
and that we'll be using in our discussion as we go through. And I find that much of the misunderstanding and misstatement, maybe not misunderstanding, but certainly misstatements uh, in this issue involve uh, the improper use of some of these terms. All right, let's very quickly, and again, I think this is uh, common knowledge to most of you. All right, the first term I have there is the autographer. Nice Greek word here, auto and grapha, all right, uh, the writing itself, the writing itself. The actual document, the autographer, the autographer, refer to the actual documents that were written by the inspired author's own hand or by his secretary. And you can see in 1 Corinthians 16 and Romans 16 that that was sometimes done. But that's the original document, all right? When Moses wrote what he wrote, he wrote it on something, all right? He wrote it on something. And as God breathed out those words, he recorded those words on something. That something that he wrote on, we refer to as the autograph, all right? The autograph, the original document that was actually in the hand of the inspired author, all right? We don't have those, all right? We don't have those. I believe they existed, obviously. I believe they existed because we have the words that are preserved from that. But the autographer, the autograph refers to that actual document that was written by uh, either the author or the scribe, as Paul indicates he used sometimes, that supernaturally intended and supernaturally controlled and supernaturally given uh, word, 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 every word by the Spirit of God. Autographer, all right? Corrupt, corrupt. And, and here's, I think, one of the words that are more frequently used incorrectly in this context than anything else. Corrupt. It's a term, we talked earlier, right? We talked earlier about getting a certain jargon, all right? Having a certain jargon in various disciplines that we have to understand within that discipline what that term means. And if we come to it as an outsider, right, if we come to some of these terms as an outsider uh, who don't know anything, who doesn't know anything about that, we're going to misunderstand. We're going to misunderstand. Just as we talked about baseball terms, I look at that and it doesn't make any sense unless I know. This is a term here that I find many people using in regard to textual criticism who are outsiders, if I can put it in those terms, who hear the word, who hear the word and infuse the word with what it means over here in regard to a rotten vegetable or something, all right, and applies it to the uh, to the text, and it becomes a very uh, pejorative term. Here's in within the discipline of textual criticism. Here's what corrupt means: to alter from the original or correct form. Uh, of the, of the te to, to alter from the original or correct form of the text. In this sphere of usage, it does not have a moral or pejorative connotation. It simply refers to a reading at variance with the original. All right? A corrupt re Are there corrupt readings? Yes. Yes. Now, does that mean that the person that made the alteration had this agenda to undermine and no, it simply means that it's an alteration, all right, an alteration. And that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're dealing with. Uh, and ultimately, and we'll, we'll see this as we go through, I think I have the, these terms here. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll hear people talking about a corrupt text or a corrupt manuscript. Okay. As though some are not corrupt. Every manuscript is corrupt in that sense. Every text is corrupt in that sense. Because it's not the autographa. And stuff happened. And we'll talk about some of the stuff that happened. So what term we put over here, a corrupt blank, a corrupt blank is going to say a lot about our understanding. But it is not a pejorative term. Right? It doesn't have negative connotations in the sense of having some sinister uh, motive uh, for making it. 
and, and you put this in the context of, uh, you know, let, let's just, in, in the copying process, we'll have more to say about this, but right in, in the copying process, um, stuff happened. All right, they didn't have Xerox machines, right? Uh, copying machines. They didn't have printers that they could just say, all right, here's the original now, make blank number of copies. No, everything was done by hand, either one for one, or very often it was done by uh, a group of people like this, right? And someone would be reading the manuscript that was before them, and now you copy down what you read. Or right, let's just presuppose here that, uh, you know, we want to do that. We want to do that. Uh, I, I, I didn't have enough of these handouts to give out, so we're going to, uh, and the Xerox machine is down, so let me dictate this to you, all right, word for word, every one of you, and you copy down what I say. I wonder, you know, I, I wonder how much, even if we did it the Bible. Let, let, let's say I, I we, we wanted to copy the Bible here, and uh, before we started copying together, I want your... I want you to sign the creed, sign this creed, sign this confession that you believe in inspiration, that you love the Lord, that you, all right. Uh, now with that creed in hand, we're going to copy together the word. And I will dictate it. I will use my impeccable Midwestern accent uh, to read so there be no confusion of sound. Uh, everything will be enunciated properly and impeccably, and I will read this, and you copy down what I read to you. And we're going to start in First Chronicles, all right, where so and so begat so and so and so and begat so. That's God's word. He breathed out every one of those words, every one of those words breathed out by God. We love them. We want to know what they are. We want to preserve them, right? Because we. Now you copy down. Now with your confession of faith that you believe in inspiration, that you believe in the authority of God and the inerrancy of the word and blank, blank, blank. You copy down what I write. Now we're going to collect those. And I wonder, all right, I wonder how many, if two of them would look the same all the way through. I'm not going to tell you how to spell the words. You're going to spell them on your own. Would there be misspellings of some of those names? My guess is. Did you misspell them because you hate God? All right? Did you misspell them because you hate God or because you don't know how to spell? All right? Because you don't know how to spell, right? Not a state, but what you have done, it, you have a corrupt text, all right? You have a corrupt reading at that point because you have varied from what the original would have been. Uh, that's corruption, all right? That's corruption. So I, I, I want to get away from the idea that it's always morally, that there was a moral or a sinister uh, motive, Behind that, no, it's just looking at the facts. It is something that differs from what the original. All right, the next term. I'm just defining terms here. Uh, the next term I have here uh, is addition. Addition. An addition is a printed or a published form of text. And it's applicable both to the original language text uh, or the versions. All right. An addition is a printed or published text. Um, not to be confused with a manuscript, not to be confused with a reading, edition is, so this, this book here, the revision revised, yeah, uh, is an edition, and mine is reprinted from the quarterly review, conservative classics, whatever, I don't know, sometimes whatever edition it might be, right? Uh, it's a printed, published text. This here is a edition. It's a Thomas Nelson. It's a Thomas Nelson edition. All right. Maybe you've got a Cambridge edition. Maybe you have a uh, Oxford edition. This is a Thomas Nelson edition. All right. It's simply the printed form uh, of uh, of the text. Uh, majority text, majority text. Majority text, by this, I mean the largest number of witnesses to that agree on any given reading. It would be possible for a given manuscript to sometimes be in the majority 
and sometimes in the minority. All right, majority text. When I talk, when I talk about the, and I'll be talking much about the majority text. That's where I want to end up here. The majority text represents the largest representation of manuscripts for a particular reading. All right, that's all we mean by it. All we mean by it. All right, now I probably put that in the wrong order here, but uh, manuscript, manuscript. What is a manuscript? Manuscript. The actual document of the copy text. It could be complete or incomplete. It could be on papyrus or parchment. It could be written in unseal or minuscule. All right. The manuscript is the actual document in hand. All right. It's something physical. Something physical. It can be complete. We have some Greek manuscripts. We have some Greek manuscripts that are of the entire Bible, Septuagint and New Testament included. It's the manuscript, very, very long, complete. We have other manuscripts that are very fragmentary. Uh, only a portion of this or a portion of that, this book or that book or a portion. All right, the manuscript is the actual document at hand. Uh, it very well may be that that manuscript uh, can be dated at X date, all right? But it has readings that we'll see that may be even earlier. The manuscript is the actual document in hand. Uh, let, let's skip received text here just for a moment. Uh, skip down to variant reading. Let me, I don't know, can't understand the order in which I put those words for some reason. Say what? Alphabetical. Are they alphabetical? I didn't even notice. I probably did that. I put all these terms down in a logical way. It's probably, here's what happened, I'm sure. I put all the terms down in a logical way. My wife looked at it and put it in a ma in, <laughs> <laughs> So she looks at things one way. I, I, I look at things logically. She looks at things elementarily. All right, there you go. <laughs> uh, I think I, that must be what happened. I'm looking at this. How in the world did I? Yeah, it, is, it, it is alphabetical, isn't it? Yeah, I see that now. Um, which makes no sense in terms of my lecture, but so we've confused things, but that's all right. Manuscript. Uh, skip down to reading, variant reading. Variant reading. The particular, the particular part of the text, word, phrase, or paragraph, that differs between manuscripts. The variants are either intentional or unintentional. Again, any reading at variance with the original is said to be corrupt. Okay? All right, let's see how this works. <clears throat> 